Thank you, Mr. Bond. Let me now introduce the panel for our first panel discussion on elements of persuasive advocacy and effective cross-examination for international arbitration. The panelists are Ms. Judith Gill, Queen's Counsel and Arbitrator at 20 Essex, Mr. Faisal Hussain Nakwi, Managing Partner at Pandari Nakwi Riyadh, Dr. Matthew Sikom, Partner at White and Case LLP, Mr. Amit Sibyl, Senior Advocate at the Supreme Court of India and the Delhi High Court, Mr. Francis Xavier, Senior Counsel and Regional Head of Dispute Resolution Group at Rata in Tan, Singapore LLP. Moderating this panel is our court member, Mr. Tejas Karya, and partner and head of arbitration at Shardul Amarchand Mangaldasan Company. A very warm welcome for our moderator and panelists, please. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, we have this first panel session where we have uh, uh, going to discuss about uh, the aspects of oral advocacy and uh, cross-examination. Uh, we have a very eminent panel today. Uh, all of you would be discussing uh, with all of us in uh, the uh, individual sessions during the day. But we thought of starting uh, today's day with an overview of the uh, art of advocacy uh, and in, in oral hearing as well as in cross-examination. Uh, just to introduce uh, uh, the panel, uh, you have their details uh, already. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Judith Gill, uh, Mr. Francis Xavier, uh, Mr. Faisal Hussain Nakwi, uh, Dr. Mac Matthew Sakam, and Mr. Amit Sibyl. And uh, we wanted to make it uh, more interactive, but there are so many topics uh, that we thought of uh, giving you an overview of all the topics uh, rather than uh, having a discussion over it. But we will try to discuss amongst ourselves. And if you have any questions, uh, please put it in a Q&A uh, uh, box and we will be happy to uh, answer that. Uh, to begin with, uh, we can uh, start with the, the what are the key features of uh, persuasive uh, written and oral advocacy. Now, if you all know that uh, oral advocacy is important, but uh, written advocacy is, is equally important for uh, arbitration because uh, the arbitrators do read and and some of have we have experience of litigation where we rely more on uh, oral advocacy uh, but written advocacy is also uh, extremely important and if i can ask mr sibyl to share his views because he has an extensive experience in in appearing in uh, uh, indian supreme court and, and other courts and also in arbitrations so how important is oral and written advocacy in international arbitration Thank you, Tejas. Let me start with oral advocacy. As you rightly said, arbitrators do read, but we give them a lot to read. They have before them extensive pleadings, documentary evidence, oral evidence, uh, possibly written submissions. Oral advocacy gives us an opportunity either at an interim stage or at the final stage of arbitration proceedings to help arbitrators navigate through that morass of material in a manner that we can point out our key points that we believe we have proved in the course of the proceedings, the inferences to be drawn from those facts, the application of law to those facts, and the attempt to persuade them that our client is entitled to relief. But for that, we have to get them to listen. And for that, it's important to earn their trust. They must believe that there's a reasonable prospect that we will be of real assistance to them. How do we achieve that? Well, just a few quick points given the time limits. No substitute, they just for thorough preparation. Thinking deeply about your case to try and fashion a narrative that well fits the facts and the law Presenting the case in a simple manner uh, without, of course, being simplistic or unfair, using even pictures or diagrams to reduce complexity, even in the course of oral presentation. Trying to explain the logic and rationale behind legal concepts, I think, is important in international arbitration because arbitrators need not necessarily come from the substantive legal background that governs uh, the, the arbitration. 
avoiding citing cases without giving a context factually, listening to the arbitrators and being responsive to them, looking at their body language, addressing their questions without ignoring them, and trying to get a sense of where they are in their thinking on the case and not interminably arguing a point that you know they are rejecting so as to irritate them. Trying to understand their background before you come to the arbitration. Are they former judges, their previous judgments if they are, their writings, places where they've expressed their view to get a sense, for example, of what their approach is on contractual interpretation, just to give an example. Your own body language is important, sitting up straight, not slouching, engaging with the arbitrator, making eye contact when, when making your points, paying attention to how they are responding to you. Are they looking to you for help or to your opponent and reacting accordingly? Are they getting bored? Then try to engage their attention. Do you get a sense that they feel you've gone on too long? Then curtail your arguments, which I must do now and bring us to written advocacy. Well, written advocacy, as you rightly say, is equally important and increasingly important because the objective for all of us is to expedite proceedings in arbitration. And arbitrators do read. So it's very important and valuable to have effective written submissions. In terms of content, a lot of the points I've already made for oral submissions will apply to the written, but it, it, is, it allows the arbitrators to have a far more effective oral hearing because they've already read the written submission that you might submit before you make your oral arguments. And so you can focus on certain points and the arbitrators can direct you to focus on certain points where they need your assistance. But quick points, attention to structure and flow of the written submissions, simplicity and succinctness will be critical. Again, pictorial dep depictions, diagrams, wherever it brings clarity and reduces complexity. Supporting propositions with clear references to the pleadings, evidence, and case law by reference. Being selective in your quotations of judgments, not just quoting swathes of judgments without applying your mind to the relevance of the paragraphs you're quoting. Using headings and subheadings for ease of navigation and comprehension for the arbitrator. And of course, last but not least, no substitute for good content Make sure you don't forget in all these stylistic points to present your positive case and address the responses of your opponent. Thank you. That was quite power packed and uh, uh, covered almost everything what we need to learn. Uh, amazing. So this is a checklist of, of your oral and written advocacy, what you have. And now we will develop uh, during the day, uh, two days with you, how to master that. and. We all should try to achieve as much as possible, but we have certain situations where we don't have time to do that, uh, and, and that may be an urgent interim relief before emergency arbitrator or or some interlocutory application where we don't uh, uh, have uh, so much of advantage of, of uh, time uh, at our hand, and we need to be very very quick. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask Mr. Z uh, Xavier, is that uh, what is the difference between uh, the main pleading and interlocutory uh, pleading? So is there any difference uh, between the uh, style of drafting uh, this uh, pleadings and, and how do we approach uh, them differently? Okay. Um, thank you, Tejas. Now, I think uh, there are two kinds of interlocutories. Uh, one would be like the one that uh, Tejas pointed out where, you know, you're on the fly. Um, maybe you just got the papers hours ago and you're before an emergency arbitrator, you know, the following day. Uh, and you will have interlocutories where you would have put in written submissions. I think you need to bear three things in mind. A lot of the ground has been actually been covered by Amit very helpfully. But first, bear in mind that uh, arbitration is far less adversarial than court. So tone it down, right? Tone down the gladiatorial approach. Uh, and a lot of it is paper driven. So ahead of a lot of interlocutories, you would already have put in detailed written submissions. And again, Amit's points on how you should manage written advocacy is key. And don't forget that the tribunal is likely to be very experienced. They are seasoned practitioners, so you don't have to uh, teach them the rudiments, right? So I think I start with a don't. So if you have had put in written submissions, never, ever, ever read your written submissions. It still gets done and you know it puts everybody to sleep, right? Uh, what you should do is, um, because you need to be very brief and pithy, have a clear roadmap, 
um, emphasize your main points, ditch your iffy arguments, don't waste time, even if they are in your subs, you know, ditch them, go to the crux, go into the jugular. Uh, and as Amit says, keep it very pithy, right? Concise and clear, right? Uh, the simpler uh, your, your language is, the, the better. Uh, Amit mentioned that the last two points I want to touch on, targeted use of authority. Don't read in extenso, right? The, the, you know, they are not uh, babies for you to spoon feed them. They know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, last point, again, Amit emphasizes, anticipate questions. There'll be areas in your submission which are the, the maybe the weak links and perhaps not so clear. Be ready. And when, when the tribunal raises it, don't feel it's an interruption or a disturbance. Welcome it and deal and address with it fully. That's it. Back to you, Tejas. Uh, thanks. Thanks. That's a great overview. Uh, one thing you uh, mentioned, uh, Francis, was very important is have a roadmap. Uh, because uh, it's, it's good to have a roadmap. And unless we have uh, that for the entire case, uh, we see a lot of flip-flop happening in the middle of the case. And, and we don't know the case strategy. So uh, if I may ask uh, Ms. Gill uh, to explain us how important it is uh, to have a roadmap or, or an entire strategy for your case uh, from the beginning, because uh, we see that uh, in, in, in normally in Indian arbitrations as compared to international is that we amend our pleadings in the middle and the, everything is put to uh, back to square one. So how important is to have a case strategy from the beginning? Yes, I think I think not just in the middle, I think uh, throughout parties will often try and amend their case. And I think it's interesting because it, it's been touched on already twice. Um, as you say, Savi uh, uh, is referring to a roadmap. That's one way to look at it. Uh, I think we also heard talk of fashioning a narrative, which is not it, it really it all comes down to the same thing. And, and the idea of a case theory is really just a a convenient label that's that's developed. And I think really what, what we're getting at in, in this is to encourage counsel to try to develop a coherent and accurate account of the case that they are presenting. And in some ways that's sort of statement of the obvious, but it is surprising how often people will draw on all different aspects of the case without really having a clear picture uh, of how it all fits together. And so the idea of a case theory is uh, really to try to develop that. Uh, and it's not just the facts, but also the legal basis of the case that's being advanced. So it's effectively the story of your case, or as I would describe it, how you're going to win it. How are you going to win this case? That's your case theory. And how do you go about it? Well, you need to find out as much as you can about the case. Uh, as you start developing your case theory, you need to talk to the witnesses. You need to uh, think about the, the, the legal aspects of your case, what elements you need to prove to establish that legal case, where the evidence, how the documents support that, how the witnesses support that, uh, and so forth. And then you need a conscious brainstorming effort when you've collated the information to think about, well, how am I going to present this case? How does it, uh, how does it fit together? Um, and the key aspect, I think, is maintaining objectivity. It, it, is, it, it happens all the time. We're all guilty of it that when we're fighting for our client, we tend to look at it through um, a certain prism. And actually, when you're developing your case theory, it is crucial that you be as objective uh, as you possibly can. Um, and beware what they call confirmation bias, which is everything that comes in, rather than looking at it objectively to say, does that fit my case theory? They try and shape whatever the information is, whether it's legal aspects, whether it's factual aspects, they try and shape it into the pre-existing case theory. That's not the way to do it. That will, that will give rise to difficulties um, because ultimately, chances are that will come undone. So you need to try to maintain objectivity. 
what is the, the real advantage of this? As I say, it's a coherent story of your case. It will help you determine what is relevant. So if you have a new slew of evidence come in, which is perhaps not what you, you knew before, how does it fit with your case theory? Does it undermine it? Does it support it? Is it really quite neutral? Does it really matter? Uh, and I think so that it, it, it helps you focus on relevance. It helps you focus on questions you might get or arguments that the other side might put because you're think, trying to think objectively uh, about how it all fits together. So in my mind, a case theory, whatever name you want to call it, whether it's fashioning a narrative, whether it's a roadmap, whether it's a case theory, it is essentially a requirement that you take the time to actually analyze the case from a holistic point of view to work out what is relevant, what is uh, the coherent story of your case, uh, and therefore what you should include, how you should structure your submissions, uh, and as I say, how you then win the case. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. That's, that's very helpful because unless we have that brainstorming session prior to we jump into the real uh, arbitration uh, and have uh, uh, an objective approach throughout, uh, it's very difficult to win the arbitration. And the whole objective of doing an arbitration is to win at the end of it. But invariably, what we do is before we go into the arbitration or during the arbitration, we need to take the support from the national courts. Uh, and either the uh, same lawyer, set of lawyers, or the or, or uh, uh, your colleagues in the uh, uh, big law firms, uh, we have uh, to go to court and and uh, plead. Uh, so there is always a difference between what we do before the arbitral tribunal and how we uh, do it before the court. So uh, if I can ask Mr. Nakvi to explain how is different between the advocacy style in the national courts and, and how is it different and how do we reconcile the both? Well, thank you, Tejas. I'd like to begin by noting that obviously the difference depends upon the point of comparison. So I'm familiar with Pakistani court proceedings and which I think are fairly similar to Indian court proceedings. So that will be what I'll be uh, drawing a difference uh, to. One of the first points to note is that unlike domestic proceedings, arbitration work tends to be very fiercely focused in terms of time. So you will have you know, uh, some time in between hearings, but when a hearing happens, that's it. That's the time period that you get. Domestic proceedings quite often tend to be episodic and be particularly trials can go on for months, years, for a fairly, fairly long time and on a continuous ad hoc basis. That doesn't work in uh, international arbitration. In international arbitrations, if you have a time period and you have a good panel, normally those people are booked up for a very long time in advance. You don't get to move dates around. So you have to be very careful about timing issues or at the international level. The second point that I'd make is that uh, international arbitration work normally happens to be the equivalent of trial work, which is actually something that uh, quite often lawyers in Pakistan and I would um, um, my understanding is to a certain extent in India as well, people are not used to trial work, particularly at the lower court level, is handled by a different set of lawyers and is sort of seen as you know, the black hole from which points emerge to be argued at the appellate stage. And occasionally, I presume in places like Bombay or uh, Delhi, where you have original jurisdiction, there you will have more trial experience, but it's a different style. You have to argue based on the facts. So it's less international arbitration tends to be in that sense more based on the facts, whatever you have, rather than what legal theory you can spin out of it. The next point that I would make is, and this is uh, true certainly for Pakistan, is that your room for exaggeration is limited. Now in India and in Pakistan, you have something like a theory which is called separating the wheat from the chaff. So the judges assume that what the lawyers would say will include some amount of, um, I would say irrelevant or incorrect stuff and they are going to be the ones doing the sorting. Before international uh, tribunals, what I found is that your room to add, you know, for buffery, for exaggeration is quite limited. So if you want to guard your credibility, you have to do a far better job than you would do in local court. The final point that I'd make is that uh, the international arbitration um, panelists or people in international arbitration tend to be very, very senior lawyers or senior retired judges, people who have had a huge amount of experience, they've seen it all, they've done it all. And in that context, 
trying particularly to be humorous is not a good idea. These are, I mean, I've seen people pull it off. For example, Fali Nariman in a, I represented Pakistan in proceedings against India under the Indus Water Treaty and I was much younger lawyer then. But, you know, at the end of a very serious hearing, Mr. Nariman got up and made a joke and he pulled it off. But by comparison, I saw, let's say, a local lawyer in a hearing about a year ago in London. He tried to start with a joke and it fell very, very badly. So by and large, I think, unless you're at the level of Mr. Nariman and you can pull it off, I would say that people should stick very, very closely to the facts. Keep it very simple. Do not go for an exaggerated emotive style, which works more in local courts and build your case on the facts rather than on the, you know, obviously the law is very important and we'll be coming to that, but this is more a case built on facts. So the facts come before the law in terms of emphasis. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sibyl, you have any quick thought on, on uh, those because you, you have experience of both uh, dealing with uh, Indian courts and also the arbitral tribunals. So any, any thoughts very quickly? Yeah, Tejas, I, I think the accent has to be on compression. Uh, in, the, in the Indian courts, uh, you find that judges adjourn hearings and so on. The, I, I would say, and I don't want to repeat what Faisal had said, but the arbitration brings much greater discipline to your practice. And it necessitates that discipline for all the reasons that Faisal has explained. Having said that, uh, I think we need to have much greater discipline in our court practice. And when I speak of compression, uh, while court arguments go on in extenso, the, it should not be that way. Indeed, we need to learn from arbitration in courts. We say that the purpose, the, the <clears throat> object of arbitration is speedy resolution. Well, courts have even less luxury of time. So it's ironic that we are saying here that lawyers will argue both the grain and the chaff in courts, and they will argue only the grain in arbitration. Faisal is absolutely right, but it's deeply unfortunate. A judge has so many cases in a day in India and Pakistan and various other jurisdictions, doesn't have time to hear lawyers arguing both the grain and the chaff. And we need to obviously bring the best practices from arbitration to courts. It's a strange thing to say, but it's true when we look at comparing Indian courts to arbitration. Yeah, that's a very fair comment and, and, and it's work in progress. We need to achieve it uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, but uh, we sometimes also see that uh, we have to mold our case uh, depending on the, who the tribunal is. Uh, of course, the advocacy styles are uh, more or less same, same uh, in, in any kind of international arbitration. But we have basically two kinds of tribunal, the civil law tribunal and a common law tribunal. And, and speaking personally, the way the procedure is uh, uh, designed by these tribunals are quite different. Uh, so if I can ask uh, Dr. Sekam to uh, take us through, is there any difference in advocacy style when you are faced with a civil law uh, background tribunal uh, or a common law or a mix of both because I've done arbitration before mix of both and, and we have seen the difference in amongst the tribunal members uh, as we go along so what are your thoughts on that uh, thanks Tejas I mean yes I mean the simple thing here is the first rule of advocacy and frankly public speaking is know your audience and when you're appearing before any tribunal or any judge or any person you're seeking to persuade, the number one thing you need to consider is what baggage does that person bring with them? Now, obviously, everybody has their own idiosyncrasies, but lawyers, as between civil lawyers and common lawyers, have particular baggage because each agrees which system is best, which is their own system. Now, when this actually comes down to the question of advocacy and cross-examination, I think you need to consider those differently because both common law and civil laws as a general matter have, have advocacy, have oral advocacy. And many civil law countries like France, which is the system that I know best, has a long history of great advocates. But the difference is largely actually an extent because before the civil tribunals of France, you will have an opportunity to plead your case orally before the judge, but it's quite brief. And the emphasis on the written thing 
So what you'll find is often the difference between the lawyers is the patience they have, uh, basically how long you can have for oral advocacy. Now, cross-examination is the different thing because in civil law tradition, lawyers play a massively secondary role. Generally, you have to prove your case through contemporaneous documents and you can only rely on witness testimony in narrow circumstances. Obviously, the common law is the inverse. You even end up with this kind of rather strange system where you need witnesses to confirm documents, which in, in a sense, a civil lawyer would find most absurd because the document would generally be the best evidence in and of itself. So what you end up there is the situation where you're much, much less likely to be able to persuade a civil law arbitrator through witness testimony, and they're likely to have less uh, patience for them too. And you can emphasize this in, in closing by just looking at a fundamental rule that many common lawyers don't know. And that's the rule that in most civil law countries, you can't present a witness who is an employee of the company that's the party to the proceedings. And they say, well, you, you can't, of course, because that person won't be neutral. That person won't be objective. We can't trust them to tell the truth because they have so much tied to uh, the case. They're, they're so much invested because they're an employee of the company. So that what that shows you, the extent to which civil lawyers and common lawyers can differ in their view of witness testimony. Yeah, and, then, and that is to be kept in mind always because uh, it's very difficult to anticipate how the tribunal will react to certain things and we are taken by surprise. So the prior experience or the knowledge uh, uh, would uh, really uh, help. Uh, but uh, uh, what we sometimes feel is that we don't have a very solid case and there are certain weaknesses uh, in the case and we don't know how to handle it. Uh, and the beauty in, in strategy lies in uh, handling your weakness rather than uh, emphasizing on, on the strengths. Uh, and uh, that's where we, when we have senior counsels, we, we take their advice on, on how to handle the uh, uh, kind of weaknesses. So if I can start with Mr. Sibyl and then I'll, I'll quickly take views from Mr. Xavier also with regard to how to handle the weakness in the case. And how, how do we try to uh, not suppress it, but at the same time uh, distinguish uh, on facts or in law, uh, the weakness of the case? So, Tejas, Faisal mentioned uh, Mr. Fali Nariman uh, in his remarks. And I just wanted to start with a quotation from Mr. Nariman's autobiography before memory fades. And I quote, it is an illusion to think that great cases are won or lost because of their inherent strength or weakness. In any case, it is not universally true. Advocacy plays a vital role simply because the judge is also human like the advocate. Now, any case, Tejas, is a, is a mix of strong and weak points. And it's essential as part of advocacy to marshal those weak points, as you said. And the first step in, in doing that is just like the first step in treating any ailment is diagnosis. So you have to first identify the weaknesses in your case and recognize what they are. Uh, you then have to put yourself, in my view, in the shoes of the other side and anticipate their defenses and think of what you might have argued if you were in their place. Uh, with that in mind, you have to craft the pleadings and strategy for the entire entire matter in a proactive way with, with Judith's case theory uh, and not in reaction to the strategy of the other side as it unfolds. Of course, you react to the strategy, but your approach is not reactive. It has to be proactive, else you'll fall behind in the course of the arbitration. Uh, and this will, this will be important for your strategy on pleadings, discovery, evidence, cross-examination, oral submissions, all of it. Now, what do you do if you have some fundamental weaknesses on, on merits, for example? Well, there are some things you can do. You can focus on, for example, whether there are weaknesses in how the opponent has framed its case, even though it may have a strong case on the merits, deficiencies in the reliefs that they have sought, jurisdictional issues. If your case is weak on facts, start with the law. If your case is weak on law, try to focus on facts or unfair conduct of your opponent's client. Choose your battles. Don't let your opponents choose them for you. Be willing to argue at times on a demurrer so as not to engage with the strongest points of the other side. As a general rule, put your best point first, 
leave your weak points for later because otherwise arbitrators might assume that you have a weak case uh, uh, and switch off before you come to your best point. Uh, if you get the arbitrators on your side at the outset with your stronger point, they might be more sympathetic when you come to the weaker points in the course of your oral advocacy. Uh, look to preempt your opponent's arguments to a certain extent uh, by addressing them in your submissions. If done subtly, it can work well to poison the well before they start their response. Uh, sow the seeds in the arbitrator's mind of answers to arguments of the other side. You might be able to then steal their thunder, soften the, soften the blow of their submissions. And, and it also helps earn the trust of the arbitrators because they look to you as a fair person who's put both sides of the case, tried to address the weaknesses as well up front. Uh, that being said, obviously don't forget to put forward the positive side of your case first uh, before you come to the preemptive part. Thanks. Uh, so again, that's quite comprehensive. Uh, and, and if I can ask Mr. Xavier for his thoughts uh, uh, very quickly on this point. Well, you know, Tejas, I think uh, Judith and Amit have said it. The, the central thing is this. The heart of the case is the case theory. And so your case theory must be shatterproof. It must be blast proof. It must take into account the weaknesses at the periphery of your case or at the heart of your case. So your, despite the weaknesses, your case theory should survive. And that's it. So the, the key is in coming up with a th case theory that is robust enough to be handle, to handle the inherent weaknesses uh, which would be present in every given case. Sure. So uh, that, that's quite helpful and, and we should keep that in mind. But uh, moving to uh, another topic of, of virtual hearings. Now, now we have seen in last six months or so, everything has turned virtual. Uh, so what are the tips uh, for uh, handling the virtual hearing? Because it's not the same as in-person hearing and, and we have all gotten used to uh, how to uh, handle uh, ourselves. So what are the do's and don't, don'ts for uh, virtual hearing, Francis? So, you know, I, th I think there's a few checklists which everyone, I think, you know, uh, I feel like I'm teaching my grandmother to suck eggs. So the first would be, you know, the technical aspects. Bandwidth, you know, I... I do as much as five screens, right? Um, uh, one for someone who's talking, second, the gallery view, uh, then one for transcripts, one for documents that are being referred to, one documents which my team is showing me uh, as something I might want to use, uh, but it's up to you, right? Uh, witness safeguards is very important, right? Um, so we've had cases, I, I said as an arbit sole arbitrator in a case where the witness was being signaled uh, to on a yes or no answer and uh, Fortunately, somebody in the room picked it up. Uh, but witness safeguards, 360 degree cameras, uh, make sure there is no ability for the witness to mute his sound and then get onto some kind of a you know, side conversation uh, that uh, you know, the camera is facing the door so nobody can come in, uh, things like that. The third would be document referencing. You know, when you're doing a trial or an interlocutory application, you want to flash documents. And many, many cases sometimes get delayed and the tribunal gets very irritated uh, because, you know, they're waiting 10 minutes for the document to be flashed. So be on top of it. Either get a separate uh, service provider to flash the documents or get your team member, especially in cross-examination. It would be perhaps a night before where you would know your sequence of documents. So maybe brief a team member and get your team to flash it. Um, Team interaction. Now, in real life, you know, you'll have an army of uh, assistants and you can refer. But, you know, in different stages of lockdown, that may not be possible. It may be possible for you to have your team with you, uh, but you need to sort it out. You need to have a seamless system of being able to talk to your team. Uh, WhatsApp to me doesn't work because I already have five screens and to look at a six screen, you know, uh, and it can't buzz, so it doesn't work for me. Uh, but the sixth screen, I also, you know, sometimes my team will put up a chat. So if it's in front of you, you can see. It. So, so that's something that you need to work on. Um, the last two things is uh, going into the, the substance, but uh, it's very important, given what Matt has said, to know what level of formality is required, right? You, you get all kinds of tribunals. Some tribunals operate it like it's a court hearing. They want you to put or suggest uh, a contrary point to, to, to witnesses on the other side. And other tribunals don't care. You could put a general put, you know, or not at all. Uh, 
So you need to know your tribunal, be very clear what is their expectation of you and depending on their background. The last point I want to make is something um, that Faisal touched. Uh, I think in a virtual hearing, drop the theatrics. You don't have the courtroom at atmosphere. Drop the theatrics, go for the jugular and just do your job. Thank you. Okay, these were all practical tips and, and we all uh, have, have learned ourselves. But yes, it's always good to know and, and understand uh, how to behave yourself because it's quite different than uh, the, uh, the real setup. Uh, but uh, uh, there are certain issues where we face uh, uh, in the arbitration is these ethical issues of, of making uh, certain statements or, or presenting certain witnesses uh, which may not be true and, and, and uh, we sometimes face with this situation uh, from the other side uh, and how to deal with it or, or sometimes we ourselves uh, uh, are not sure of certain facts and end up making submissions uh, before the tribunal. Uh, we have something uh, in IBA rules, uh, which is a soft law, which does not apply. Uh, but generally, there are principles which are set up in uh, the uh, international arbitration community, uh, which deal with these aspects. And if I can uh, request uh, Ms. Gill to uh, share with uh, us, uh, what are those things which we should keep it in mind in terms of the ethical guidelines uh, while handling uh, the arbitration matters? Sure. I mean, I think the starting point for, for this topic is, is the fact that you have to recognize that one of the slightly unusual features of uh, international arbitration is that you get uh, participants from all over the world, many different legal cultures and jurisdictions, where they have very different uh, expectations and practices uh, uh, and the like. And, you know, there is a um, it, it, there's a difficult balance to draw between what in some jurisdictions would be just seen as a slightly colorful exaggeration um, and relatively normal and other jurisdictions where that would be considered deliberately misleading. Um, and, you know, that, that happens a great deal. I, I actually just was reading submissions a couple of days ago where you had precisely one party alleging that the other was misleading the tribunal and the other was saying look you may not agree with us but you don't have to keep saying we're misleading because we're not this is how we see it and i think you know that the heart of this issue is that you do get genuine legal cultural differences in different jurisdictions uh, and in arbitration uh, one of the reasons that the uh, iba uh, guidelines on party representation were developed was to try and, and, and hit that balance. And, and when I was actually with the IBA when we were first doing that, and we started out looking at a code of ethics and came to the conclusion, actually that is immensely difficult to do, to then have something which would be acceptable and could be imposed across the board. So what you have instead is, as you say, the, the party guidelines, which set out what I think on, in many ways would be considered common denominators across the system. So you do not uh, make false submissions that you know to be false to the tribunal. And I think most, most would all agree that that is unacceptable. It also goes on and then tries to deal with, well, what do you do if you discover that false um, uh, submissions or false evidence has been produced? How do you deal with it? And again, it, it, it's, it's very good to say, well, you have to just put it right. But of course, there may be other issues involved, confidentiality restrictions, there may be privilege issues. You know, ultimately, we act on the instructions of our, our, our clients. And so what the IBA rules tried to do was be to set out what you should do, the, the, the fact that efforts have to be made to correct the position and the client needs to have explained the consequences of not doing so. And those consequences, as the rules make, as the guidelines make clear, may include the lawyer saying, I can't act for you anymore. So there are, there is guidance, there are ways to handle this, but um, that's from a sort of slightly regulatory point of view, if you will. But I think that the, the more, the, the deeper issue here is that if you are an advocate appearing before a tribunal, you want their trust. I mean, it's already been mentioned. 
but it is actually terribly important that the, the tribunal feel that when they are listening to your submissions, they can trust what you are saying to be uh, not deliberately misleading. And if they think otherwise, then they're going to struggle. You're not going to get the benefit of the doubt. And perhaps more problematic, they're going to ask themselves, why are you misleading me? What, what is it you're hiding? What, what's so bad in your case that you have to deliberately mislead me about this? So, you know, there are, there are an awful uh, lot of shades of, of, of grey in this whole topic. But the fundamental principle of not misleading the tribunal, not allowing your witnesses to mislead the tribunal is actually, I think, a, a very important one for good practical reasons uh, and one that ap applies across the board, whichever jurisdiction you're from. Thanks. Yeah, misleading is something is a very common word in, in uh, our arbitrations because uh, we try to uh, say the other side is misleading. Matt, Matt you have any quick thoughts on, on these ethical issues? Uh, very quickly, if you have something to share. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. I agree with both things that Judith said. The key things is that in theory, I think everybody has, uh, you know, every system has a different way of dealing with these things, but it all boils down to the same thing in international arbitration, which is if, if you, as an advocate, if you've lost your credibility with the tribunal, which is a very fragile thing that can be broken quite easily, then, you know, you put yourself at a massive disadvantage. So, so. Yeah, and, and credibility, sometimes we have seen that... Um, uh, your client win uh, just because of uh, what you have shared fairly with the tribunal. And, and that brings me to the, the next uh, uh, subtopic is that how do you uh, become a lead counsel? Uh, all of us who are attending today uh, has a dream or, or is already practicing in arbitration field and, and want to become a lead counsel. So for, for, for younger uh, delegates we have today, uh, uh, Faisal, if I can ask you uh, to share uh, some tips as to how do we master our uh, uh, the advocacy skills and bring build a strong foundation to develop into a uh, lead counsel in arbitration. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, Faisal. Thank you. I think, well, one tip to being a lead advocate is to know when you're on mute. So that obviously helps. Um, I think the short version is that there is no quick path to becoming a competent advocate. Um, you, you know, as it's like the old saying, what, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer is practice, practice, practice. It works for law. It works for most disciplines. If you know your law and if you really put in the hard work, then eventually it will uh, pay off. In the context of oral advocacy specifically, and when we're talking about international arbitration, I think the point to remember is, and this follows on from what we said earlier, is that in international arbitration, oral advocacy is basically the cherry on the Sunday. It's not the Sunday itself. And you know, I think one realizes that if you just step back and take a look at the sequence of proceedings that happen. So the arbitration case will have been initiated normally through a request for arbitration, which will be in writing which will append certain documents. There will be a reply to that, that's a document. Then you will normally have at least two full rounds of pleadings. Uh, so you will have you know, a memorial, a counter memorial, a re reply, rejoinder, whatever you want to call it. There'll be two full rounds of pleadings, there'll be witness statements, there'll be reply to witness statements. So there'll be a huge pile of written documents before anything oral normally or substantive is before the tribunal. So when you're talking about you know, oral advocacy in the context of uh, international arbitration, you have to understand that there is limited scope for showing off your oral skills or your advocacy, oral advocacy skills in, before a tribunal. And what you have to do when you get that chance that is normally in, let's say, the opening arguments before a full hearing, is you have to present your theory of the case, which uh, Judith pointed out. So you have to give one big clear picture to the arbitrator and say, look, this is the way everything hangs together. So all of the different points, that person's witness statement, this law point, that factual point, you have to put it together into one coherent picture and try and make sure that that picture uh, coheres or inheres in the mind of the arbitrator so that they understand what you're trying to say. You may succeed, you may fail, 
But overall, the point that you're trying to do, what you're trying to succeed in through your oral advocacy is to say, here are all these different bits. This is how they come together. This is why my story makes sense. And that is, if you can succeed in doing that through oral advocacy, that's the most important thing. The second part of oral advocacy in, uh, in the context of international arbitration is also to present as, you know, to connect to what was said earlier. I mean, the arbitration tribunal is unlikely to know your client. It may or may not know you, but will have some sense of how you are available or how you present yourself professionally. So you are, if not a translator, but almost an ambassador for your client, and you have to make sure that their picture as presented is somewhat reasonable. And the final aspect of oral advocacy, even though you have a limited amount of time in international arbitration, is as insurance. So if you are confronted you know, with new arguments, with new topics, with new questions, you have to be able to handle those and be able to accommodate them within your theory of the case without it being absolutely shattered. So that's how oral advocacy, as I see it, fits within the ambit of international arbitration. Now that's that's well said. And um, as we know, all know, the arbitration is all about preparation, preparation, and preparation. There's nothing other than that. Uh, and and when we come to oral advocacy in arbitration, uh, is more of focus is on on the witness testimony and cross examination because we have very short opening submission and very short closing submission. But the most of the part which we spend is uh, cross examination. So Matt, if I can ask you how to prepare for a cross examination to succeed in oral advocacy. Thanks, Tejas. I mean, unsurprisingly, I echo what uh, Amit said before, what Faisal said. It's, it's actually all about hard work. And often when people see a good cross-examiner you know, do it, they think that the person is winging it and that, you know, that uh, they're just so brilliant and it's their own uh, advocacy skills that are destroying the witness, but it's not. I guarantee you that it was just a mountain of hard work. And that's why actually to, to segue from what Faisal was saying, I find often when we give young lawyers the opportunity to do their first cross-examination, they actually do an excellent job because it may be kind of a secondary witness, but they spend a hell of a lot of time preparing and they're super prepared and they do a great job. But other than hard work, I would say there's two key things in my mind to cross-examination or good cross-examination, which are interrelated. The first is you really need to know what you're trying to achieve through the cross-examination. And to add to that, realistically achieve on each given point. Because I find that cross-examiners sometimes kind of just ask questions, but they don't really have clarity as to what point they're trying to demonstrate through the line of questioning. The second thing I'd say is that it's very important in my mind to remember that cross-examination has two different purposes. Uh, one is to actually get answers that help your client's case. And the second is to actually call into question in the tribunal's mind whether the witness is actually telling the truth or whether the expert is actually you know, kind of being uh, uh, credible in its, um, in its opinion, in their opinion. And to my mind, those are two very different things, because if you're trying to get them to answer questions that help you, you don't need to call into question their credibility. Whereas by contrast, if you actually want to kind of impeach them and try to prove that they're being untruthful, it's a very different exercise. And I think if you don't have, a, have clarity in your own mind about which of those two things you're trying to achieve and you mix them, you, you, you'll end up with a suboptimal result. You no, know, that's, that's quite true. Uh, but we also see when we cross-examine, there are different styles of cross-examination. And, and Francis mentioned earlier is that uh, some tribunals want you to have a court style cross-examination of, of uh, uh, putting your case, positive case to the other side witness. Or if you don't cross-examine certain witness, uh, it is deemed to have been admitted. Uh, so if I can ask Mr. Sybil, uh, like what's your view on, on uh, uh, these different styles of cross-examination? Because Ultimately, we need to get to the truth. And is it necessary to give too much importance to this procedural aspect when we have limited time in the arbitration hearings? So this is an interesting question because it's all, it also brings in a, a major difference between certain national courts and arbitration, Tejas, uh, in terms of how people approach uh, 
the process of cross-examination. So in Indian courts, it's typical to put your case to the witness and some judges take it take it against your client if you fail to put your case to the witness. Young lawyers are taught in India that you must put your positive case to the witness of the other side, else you haven't completed your job. But actually, when you examine the Indian Evidence Act, in my view, it's not clear that you're required to do that, even in the Indian courts. When it comes to arbitration, there is less time to do all of these things. And in my view, it is not necessary in arbitration to put your case to the witness. Uh, of the other side. Uh, the IBA rules, rule 4.8, specifically indicate uh, that if you don't actually do that, uh, put your case to the witness of the other side, it will not be taken that you have admitted the case in chief of the other side's witness. And I think that's the right approach. Uh, and, and the implication of that situation in international arbitration is interesting because it, it gives rise to a strategic call that you may then have to make. Uh, if the other side puts uh, witness evidence, the witness evidence will typically be in writing. It will not be uh, orally presented. And unless you call that witness for cross-examination, the witness will not actually appear before the arbitral tribunal at all. And you might, in a given situation, take a call that you will actually not call that witness for cross-examination on the premise that it it is not taken as the consequence that you, your client has admitted the case of that witness in their examination in chief. And it is open to you nonetheless to challenge that evidence uh, in your oral arguments using your positive evidence as well as uh, other arguments on merits and, and the law. Uh, and therefore that's an interesting approach uh, that we can take in international arbitration that you don't often see uh, in, in national courts and the, and the Indian courts. You can also in arbitration, in my, in my view, be a little more selective and you're not, I think, required in international arbitration to rebut every single thing that the witness is saying if you do cross-examine them and you can focus on, on the kernel of the matter. And I think it'll irritate the arbitral tribunal if you needlessly look to contradict everything the witness says. You look at a transcript of cross-examination in the Indian courts, you find various meaningless statements made where the lawyer is putting to the opposite side's witness uh, that what he's saying is false. Does he agree? And he says, of course, I don't agree. And that's completely meaningless and immature, if you ask me, in international arbitration, a complete waste of time. I hope that's what you were looking at, uh, Tejas, in, in answer to your yes, question. Yes, yeah, exactly. And and sometimes uh, we, if you do that, uh, the tribunal takes the other, other way uh, when they, they feel that we don't know the real advocacy because we are wasting time of the tribunal. Uh, so uh, that's something we need to uh, bring into our Indian context also because many of our participants are from India and, and need to bring those best practices to India. Uh, but uh, there is always an apprehension is how much you prepare your own witness. Do you tutor your witness? Do you uh, guide your witness? So Mrs. Xavier, what's your uh, thought on that is to when it comes to preparing your own witness? Now, Matthew smiling, you know, because in this area, there's a huge chasm between civil and common law worlds. I won't go into it. We don't have time. But I think the matter is for now settled by Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the IBA rules on the taking of evidence, uh, which is a symbiotic uh, rule, uh, which says it shall not be improper for a legal advisor to interview a witness and to discuss their prospective testimony with them. So on that basis, I would say First of, first of all, you need to prepare your witness thoroughly so that he can withstand cross-examination and his testimony will survive cross-examination. So first of all, he needs to, you need to remind him, it's like an exam. He needs to be, have mastered the material, his previous affidavits, uh, his, you know, his witness statements, and not only his main witness statements, there may be peripheral documents, there may be parallel uh, cases in court, parallel arbitrations where he's given statements. He needs to, he needs to be reminded of all of it because the most devastating cross-examination is to point to something which completely says the opposite of what you assert in this case. Um, and um, you need to set the scene for him you, because, you know, he may not never have been, been to court. You need to explain to him the rules of cross-examination, uh, you know, what it means when, when somebody says, I suggest to you, blah, 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 as opposed to I put to you, blah, 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 you know. So uh, he, he needs to be acutely aware of that. You also set the scene, right? The court uh, explain to to him or her, 
you know, what the tribunal members are like, what is their, you know, their character and what are they likely to do, you know, how they are likely to question aggressively or softly. Uh, and, and obviously the nature of the person who is going to cross-examine them, what, what, you know, what is the style, right? Now, I think the, the one big point to bear in mind is when you prepare witnesses in groups, right? This is a big issue now in Singapore. Uh, for instance, um, you know, I had a case uh, in, you know, an Australian case, uh, Australian Indonesians fighting in Singapore. And in Australia for a long time, there was a rule, you cannot prepare witnesses in clusters. So, you know, if there's an issue to do with some, you know, a, a, a steel uh, plant, and, you know, maybe you have five factual witnesses who know what happened, some new parts of it, others knew other parts. You know, it's common for a lawyer to want to put all of them in one room and to discuss the entire thing together. Uh, in Australia, that's not allowed. It's not been allowed for a long time. And in Singapore, the position was unclear until the Court of Appeal ruled in this case called Ernest de Sala. Uh, and the court basically said, you know, you should not, a factual or expert witnesses, you should not prepare them in clusters prepare them individually because otherwise you have to be so careful and if you cross the red line, you're in trouble. So do read the case of uh, Ernest Din Salah, the court of the case of Singapore. Obviously in Pakistan and in India, the position may be different, but be on top of you know, what is likely to be the rules. Um, you know, and the last thing I, I will do is I would actually do a mock cross-examination you know, uh, for my witnesses without of course coaching them or telling them what to do. But obviously, the practice uh, varies amongst uh, practitioners. Back to you, Tejas. Yes. So, yeah, the mock sessions always help. But how much we should tutor the witness is always a uh, great idea. Uh, but when it comes to experts, uh, the style of cross-examination is quite different. And, and uh, we have seen that the fact witness and the expert witness uh, requires uh, different treatments. If, if uh, Ms. Gill can just quickly take us through if there are any uh, things to be kept in mind uh, while cross-examining an expert. Sure. Um, I think the first thing to remember when you're cross-examining an expert is that they know far more about the subject matter than you do. <clears throat> so you've, you've, you've preparing to cross-examine this expert, uh, but this is probably what they have done uh, their entire lives, day in, day out, so you, you are unlikely to be able to beat them on technical expertise. But the important step, I think, is first of all, make sure you understand what they're saying in their report. Uh, and I'm talking really now about some of these you know, very technical, detailed reports that you, you will get. Um, as lawyers, you know, we have to adapt. But I think you, know, you need to ask the questions to make sure you understand what they're saying. You then need to assess quite how relevant their evidence is, and it is a tendency with uh, expert reports is that the experts will very often, particularly in technical cases, they will try and give the tribunal something of a teaching in many parts of their uh, expert reports. You may or may not want to cross-examine on that, but, but if, if it's not actually contentious or it's not actually relevant, there is no point in going and picking up very minor points because the thrust of their evidence will still come through. So what you need to do, I think, with an expert is establish what are the aspects of the case that they deal with that are actually central to the issues that are in dispute and focus on, on cross-examining on those. Um, having, having done that, you need to make sure that you have a basis for cross-examining them. And uh, it's, it's fairly elementary, but you will almost certainly have an expert um, on your side of the case, which deals with the same or similar issues. And you need to use that expert to work with you to help you prepare the cross-examination to identify where the, the areas of difference are, where the areas of vulnerability or perhaps overreach in what the other side's expert uh, are saying, uh, so that those are, that's what you can hone in on if they're, they're relevant issues. Um, but in doing that, you, you have to, again, be objective. Your own expert may have his own particular hobby horse about certain points in, in, in the evidence, which may either not be terribly relevant, or even if they are relevant, 
your own expert may have his own blinkers as to these issues. So I think it's really important for a lawyer when you're preparing to cross-examine an expert that you, you use your own expert, but don't follow them blindly. So you, you really question and you use your expert to try to help you develop the likely responses you might get from the expert you're cross-examining so that you can then prepare yourself in terms of where you go if you get an answer that you uh, you don't like. Um, and, and, and just on that, I think one of the things I've experienced over um, many decades is that technical experts are also very good at giving very long technical explanations, <clears throat> which sound terribly impressive, but don't actually answer the question. So you as the advocate have to be very switched on, listening very hard, don't allow yourself to be bamboozled by science and make sure you actually get an answer to the actual question you've asked. Um, I've seen it all too often that the, the, the experts will give a very difficult and impressive sounding answer, um, but it doesn't actually answer the question and the lawyer is sort of too anxious then to actually follow up. You have to do so, you have to listen and pay attention. Um, and I think the final point I would say is they are the experts. They do know what they're talking about. They may have a slightly uh, different point of view from the one you would what you would wish to promote to the tribunal. But recognize when you're dealing with experts, you're not going to score every point. And if you keep beating away at a point that the expert has dealt with well and that you're not going to be able to come back on, you're just giving them a platform if you keep beating away trying to get them to agree with you when they are clearly not going to. So that element of judgment, I think, also is perhaps more focused when you're dealing with, with, with experts, especially technical experts. Thanks, thanks. That's quite comprehensive. And now we have only one minute left. And uh, imagine if there's a chess clock uh, arbitration met, uh, what are the strategies for following uh, your best point across in one minute? So if you have a chess clock method arbitration, what are the tips for our participants? It's, it's pretty easy. It's preparation and, and fighting your battles because when you have limited time, you just have to do, you know, you just have to choose your points far more carefully and you just have to accept that the time is limited and scarcity is your enemy and you can only get so many points. So you have to choose what they are carefully. Okay, thank you. So uh, that brings us to the end of today's uh, first uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, if you have any questions, maybe uh, we can discuss over the day when, when you, we will be having the uh, individual sessions uh, with all of you. Uh, we'll be taking a half an hour break now and uh, we look forward to seeing all of you uh, in the individual sessions as per our schedule.